Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you want to put the microphone on for your talk? Maybe. Yeah, it might be better for you to just... Um, the time is 2.30, which means we're on schedule, and uh, we begin with the talks of the afternoon. So just to echo what Elia already said yesterday, um, we get a fair amount of money from ICAM to bring junior speakers in um, to this meeting. Um, and so we thank ICAM for that. We had a lot of applications for it this year, um, which gave us quite a headache in choosing uh, some of them. So congratulations to all those who made it. Um, and the next talk, without further ado, is Sylvia Neri from uh, the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, who is talking about that title you can read there as well as you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, so, Today I'm going to talk to you about non-equity prepared to response of time reversal to make the breathing superconductor. Uh, first, I want to uh, give you a general outline of my talk. So I'm going to first introduce some notation about excitation in superconductors. And then I'm going to specify what I mean for time reversal to make the breathing superconductors. And we are going to write the inward and outward that. And then I'm going to show you my other thoughts mostly. Uh, with two different uh, methods. Uh, the last one is uh, um, so we want to try to reproduce the uh, third uh, pump probe, uh, spectroscopic scenario. So uh, as we heard also this morning, there are many materials that we get to put the break spontaneously time reversal symmetry. And in this table, there are a few of these gas and uh, uh, essentially, the experimental detection of this uh, time reversal symmetry breaking is uh, kind of uh, complicated because uh, the signatures are, um, I mean, there are signatures that can be detected experimentally, but then maybe there's no always uh, an agreement uh, on those. And um, the motivation for this work is that we want to suggest another way. Uh, which is uh, looking at the spectroscopic uh, probes in um, like a spectroscopic signature, so time reversal symmetry breaking within the terrorist range. So, as I, as I said, and let me first clarify the notation for excitation in conventional superconductors. So, once we are in the superconducting regime, we have a complex order parameter like this one. And uh, uh, since uh, so delta zero is the gap opening up in the single particle spectrum. And then since the uh, order parameter is complex, so we can add the fluctuation both in amplitude and in phase. And we can then have uh, two platonic collective excitation associated here. So one is going to be the Goldstone mode, the fluctuation uh, along the rim of the Mexican ant. This, uh, this oscillation, this excitation doesn't cost any energy. And uh, uh, right, it's the Goldstone mode. While there's another excitation that costs energy, it's an amplitude fluctuation along the rim of the Maxian potential. And this is called mixed mode or Smith mode or whatever. It's an amplitude fluctuation. Now, the superconducting regime is, uh, of course, the superconducting state is charged. So this Goldstone mode gets pushed up to plasma frequency. And then the low lying excitation that remains in the terrorist range is the mixed mode. This is the picture for conventional superconductor. And for conventional superconductor, I mean that if I have the symmetry group of the system where I break the Q1 symmetry. Exactly. When what I want to what I want to talk today about is a scenario in which we break both Q1, of course, we are in a superconductor, and then time reversal. So the easiest way to do something like that, starting from the most general gap function, which are a singlet component here and a triplet component here is what I'm gonna adopt in the following uh, in the following slide. So let me let me tell you first that since we have the singlet part and the triplet part to break the universal symmetry, uh, we can uh, of course in the singlet case this is the requirement. So under complex conjugation, this thing has to be different from itself. The same uh, has to happen in the triplet part, which is uh, uh, embedded into this D vector that 
we also saw this morning. What we are gonna focus on in this talk is a northern parameter like this one. So we are in the singlet state, and what we are uh, guessing is uh, that the order parameter is multi component as two components, delta one and delta two, and delta one and delta two have different uh, form factors in this space, and there's an I in between. Such that when I apply complex conjugation, right, delta one plus I delta two is different from delta one minus. Now we focus on the 2D scenario, uh, and here I am just uh, um, taking a um, picture to show what are the, for example, the order parameters that we are going to investigate. As you can see in the 2D case, we have no nodal lines, we have just this winding of the face, and uh, uh, yeah, that's it. This is what we are going to focus on. Now, uh, for an order parameter like that, so taking that as an answer, so we can put it inside the Gibbons Landau and we can obtain the Gibbons Landau for the two components of the parameter, which is uh, uh, like the one I'm showing you here. So this blue box is uh, some sort of Mexican app for the uh, Delta one for the first component. This red one is the Mexican app for the second component. And then in the yellow boxes, I have the phase dependent interactions. Well, the green box is uh, the amplitude, the interaction, right? Now, if delta one and delta two belong to two different regs, which what all what usually happens, and the case we're gonna consider, also if they uh, belong to two to a multi-dimensional ref, then this uh, uh, first order uh, just it's gonna light up the term it goes away, ruled out by symmetry reasons, so we are left with the interaction. Now, I want to pictorically illustrate you uh, what we can picture um, this system to host as excitation. So we have two um, complex order parameter, and then we can in total have um, each of them two bosonic collective excitation. So we have four bosonic excitation. So let me just pictorically illustrate you what we can expect. So I'm just Historically, drawing this uh, gibbs landau for the first order parameter, this gibbs landau for the second one, and to it know that the equilibrium position are one purely real, the other one purely imaginary. There's some coupling between the two. And now, a Dawson mode of the system would be the picture in which these two uh, equilibrium positions are moved along the rim, both clockwise or both anti clockwise. This is a Dawson mode of the system. Then another possibility is the one of perturbing the equilibrium position such that one is going clockwise and the other anti-clockwise on the Mexican screen. The relative phase mode. Another opportunity would be the one of creating uh, this uh, amplitude oscillation, which is the uh, um, order parameter components increasing in amplitude together along the rim. This is an X mode. Okay, they go in the same direction, both increase or both decrease. And then we have a relative amplitude mode in which we have the picture that one is going up, the other is going down. Okay, so these are the four excitations that uh, we can picture to have in the system. A global amplitude, a relative amplitude, a relative phase, and a global phase mode, which is gonna be pushed out to plasma frequency as usual. Now, what I'm gonna show you now are results. <laughs> Uh, and uh, my results are in, in, they consider two scenarios. One scenario, I'm going to be at two equal zero. So I'm going to consider something like two equal zero. The second scenario, I'm putting myself at minus two. So, first, what we did to understand the dynamics of this mode and to study the excitation in this sort of system how can we excite all these modes? How can they appear? We did, sorry. Who wants to be the highest energy mode? The energy phase mode? That's the plasma mode. Global phase mode, and then put that. Green one is the plasma mode. Green one is the plasma mode. That'd be a higher signal. Just to ensure that there's not a good energy. No, no, not that. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, they would 
the orange one can also be more yeah. down, and the and the red one would be the oh, yeah. 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 So we first proceeded with a group theory classification of the oxide oxidation in these uh, kind of superconductors. So let me first uh, uh, focus on the S plus I D scenario. So we have an S wave and a D wave, which is purely imaginary. If I want to have an A1G oscillation, I'm featuring a breathing mode in both the components. So this S wave and this D wave are both oscillating in the A1G um, channel. Then I can feature uh, to excite a B1G oscillation, and this corresponds to a sweeping and a um, stretching right in this direction. And um, A2G, uh, which acts differently for the S and the D wave. In the D wave case, it's a rotation of the normal lines. This is the uh, classification that we made, and uh, uh, this table is gonna it's gonna come back later. But just for you to know, I'm defining this f of q functions for which I can excite the, this uh, symmetry oscillation. I did the same for the d plus i d case. Uh, these are uh, these are the oscillation that I uh, that I want to that I want to have. So isotropic a one g p one g a two g and b two g. We are in d in d four h. Uh, okay. And now, in order to study the dynamics and excite this sort of oscillation, we decided to adopt a time dependent BTS Hamiltonian. So it's pseudo spin formalism. I, 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 so we start with this uh, Nambu spinner, we define the Anderson pseudo spin, we write down the BTS Hamiltonian in this scenario. Such that we have this uh, end of pseudo spin protesting along this uh, pseudo magnetic field, which embeds both the interaction part and the mm -hmm. kinetic part. And then the dynamics of this end of pseudo spin is going to be given by the Planck equation. Okay, uh, we can solve this equation first, uh, I think, with the, just uh, in the linear array, in the linear regime, so this is a linear analysis. The, the, the linear perturbation I added, and now I got the plot for the collective excitation. These plots, in order for you to read them, I have to stop for just a second and explain you how to. So on the x-axis, you have this eta parameter on the on the y-axis, sorry, y-axis eta parameter, x-axis with omega uh, over two delta zero, delta zero is the synthetic uh, gap like the, the global gap of the system. So eta is a quantifier of the ratio between the two uh, components. So it's defined like so, because the two components are multiplied by B. So delta one is multiplied by the cosine of eta, delta two is multiplied by the sine of eta, and so this is the ratio. Such that I can move from eta equals zero, where I just have the cosine of zero is one, and the sine is zero, so just delta one is present in the system, and then I can tune it up to pi over four, where both components have the same magnitude. Then I can go up, where I have pi over two, and then only the third component, which is purely imaginary, but it doesn't matter, stays in the system. So for the S plus I D case, over here I have just a pure S wave, over here I have a pure D wave, and in between there's all the dynamics. And uh, these are the collective excitation in the system. These are the plots I showed you before, but now you can uh, read the plots, maybe, and there are these uh, friends that you can see. Now, what are these uh, both appearing uh, respect to the one I showed you before? So in order to identify the character of these modes, we decided to first go with some deeper Landau. So we started with the deeper Landau I showed you before. Then we allowed the fluctuation in the uh, amplitude and in the phase of both the components. Right? We wrote down the functional with this, uh, with this matrix here, the action. And then here is uh, the equilibrium. Uh, plus the excitation in the global amplitude, the relative amplitude, and relative space. What you can see here is how these masses are uh, 
coming up, right? These are the eigenvalues of this matrix. Such that at the end, thanks to this and not only this, we can then identify what we see the plot. So for example, this is a global amplitude, which is right on the, uh, not, not really, but in some point, it's uh, right on the continuum. These are relative amplitude, this is the global, this is the relative amplitude. Now we can do much more uh, than just a linear analysis. Sorry. Yeah. Relative amplitude. What about the relative space? What about the space? Yeah, in this, uh, in this uh, kind of scenario, you don't see the relative space because I'm not asking fluctuation. So for, for the kind of analysis, uh, for the kind of perturbation I did, the two plot. So we can we can do more than just a linear analysis. We can. Uh, um, to a, a quantum quench, and this uh, means that we take our ground state and uh, we uh, suddenly change uh, the state of the system. So we, we somehow uh, do some sort of shrinking of the Mexican potential to drive our system in an equilibrium position and then trigger oscillations. And we can do that in many ways. What we decided to do is to do it with a momentum dependent quench. What I'm doing is that I'm initializing the equation of motion, inserting uh, a form factor, which is not the equilibrium form factor. This is the equilibrium form factor. It's the equilibrium form factor plus some perturbation. And this FQ and adding are the one I showed you before in those stages. So I'm adding perturbation such to a sign, particularly oscillation in the system. I'm doing it uh, with, uh, okay, this is, of course, multiplied by some small parameter, uh, not even that small. I mean, I'm on an equilibrium scenario. But the, the, the thing is that uh, what I'm allowing the condensate to do is to oscillate in the channels that were not belonging to the ground state in the channel. If I do this, for example, for the D plus ID case, this is what I get a spectrum. Yeah. But that's a model of a laser pump. Better than uh, zero. Yes. In the, in, the next, in the next slide, I'm going to present a more realistic sample. What I was uh, saying for the first with the study of two was zero, and then the standard. So, numerical results uh, for the different symmetries so A1G, B1G, B2G, and A2G. These are the spectra that I obtain. And uh, for example, uh, this is a pure uh, phase mode, the phase mode. Uh, this uh, is uh, uh, exactly as the one I showed you before, and over here uh, I have a more complicated uh, sort of scenario. Um, but the point is that also, for example, in this scenario, uh, as in this uh, scenario here, since I'm doing sort of weird asymmetric uh, rotation and so I'm shifting the nodal lines, I am exciting excitation in the imaginary part, such that I do excite the Now, this is uh, all pretty much uh, theory. Uh, what we try then to do is to mimic uh, this uh, pump probe spectroscopic uh, um, a feature. To do so, we coupled our uh, Hamiltonian with the uh, uh, vector potential. The vector potential is written like that. So it's a Gaussian envelope, and we are transferring a uh, momentum two. We're in the terrace range, so the momentum two is pretty much uh, very small, but it's still there. And then uh, in Hamiltonian, we write it down in the Google loop of basis, uh, and uh, we evolve uh, uh, the equation of motion, the algebraic equation of motion for this uh, quasi-particle expectation value. Now. What I get is a spectra like this, where I'm uh, somehow deciding how to align my laser field, such that, for example, this is the plot for P was zero. This means that I'm along this line, eating the lobes of the first component, and then through the other lines of the second one. This is that what happens at fiber eight. So I'm in this direction in between. And what I'm showing you here is uh, uh, the calculation of the transient optical conductivity uh, performed all, all, always in that formalism, so they can write it down in this way. And 
the in EP that you see here is the difference in time between the pump and the probe. In a pump probe spectroscopic scenario, usually what you want to do is to apply a pump and then later on apply a probe. And you want to shift the time between the pump and the probe because you want to somehow uh, investigate the different quasi particle dynamics, right? If I'm very close to the pump or if I'm very far away from the pump. And when you go uh, along this axis, so this is what you're doing. You are um, moving away in time from the excitation of the pump, which is the strongest one. You get 52 peaks. This corresponds to the two above here. This is a line cut where I have to do Okay. Yes, uh, so uh, with a longer inspection, what we can see is that there's, uh, we can do a mapping between what we are excited with the pump and what we are excited with the quantum quantity. So we know that at P equal zero, we are exciting a P1 G oscillation. At P equal by A, we are exciting an A to G. You can believe me if I say that at P equal by over four, we are exciting a P to G. Uh, so yes, this is uh, all I wanted to show you. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. So we calculated this factor and it's, uh, um, in the case of S plus ID, D plus ID, and P plus ID. I focused on D plus ID in the talk, both with group theory and then uh, we did some pump probe simulation. We can identify the character of the modes. And yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I guess that if you have a uh, if you if you have a time reversal tends to break more than parameter. Your order parameter is going to show some internal dynamics. So you can break in many ways and reverse. So this is not the only way to break it. So it's not that you're not supposed to have an order parameter of the kind the delta one plus i delta two. That's one way. That's one way. But if you break it in that way, for example, then you're going to have some internal dynamics associated to the internal degree of freedom of your order parameter. So, for example, in helium three, since you have such a complex order in space A, and you have such a complex order parameter, then you have the squeezing mode, clasping mode, and these are due to the internal motion of the order parameter. Whenever you have... Uh, it's just a more rich... More modes. Yeah. Um, but, but having such two modes, Without, of course, sure, right. sure. Uh, but the, the peculiarity of these modes is just that they are polarization independent, for example. And when you have a multi uh, a multi uh, band system, you also gonna have many gaps. Uh, but then it, I think it depends. Uh, um, somehow, like also here, I mean, over there you should also look at the body particle spectra for for the two uh, bands that you have in the system. In this case, you have a quasi-particle continuum. You have this uh, very low line energy excitation that are somehow, let's say, for example, the scenario of part of these creeper modes. So I don't know if you're familiar with that. Okay, it's much more close to that scenario than the multi band scenario. When you have a multi band, they usually like your Fermi, your Zippo Landau is not going to look like that. So you're probably not going to have a, this uh, pi over two phase difference between the four the parameter. You're going to have some kind of delta one plus e to the pi alpha, where alpha is something else in the Zippo Landau landscape. You're going to have really easy minimum pi over two and minus pi over two. I say changes because there's interaction. I mean, over there you can have a linear coupling. It's not forbidden by symmetry. You have a multi It's another change. 
I, I just wanted to extend that briefly, if I may, in that I think the main ingredient of this is that you had two order parameters corresponding to different reps. Yes. But is there anything specific about them being in a complex superposition rather than a linear uh, different one? Uh, is there anything here that really shows this time reversal symmetry faking and not just these two order parameters? I was just curious, is there a specific signature? Or, um, which I, think is, uh, I mean, the point of having uh, these two parameters belonging to two different irreps yeah. or to multidimensional irrep is just that that Josephson uh, linear topping term goes away. Yeah, exactly. And so the precision that you have is such that in the, the amplitude sector is completely decoupled from the phase sector, which would not be the case in the right. scenario that you are describing. So in th this particular thing that gives you a complete- no, sorry, I was describing two different irreps, but combined without the eye. Combined just so that you still have the time reversal symmetry. But that case is completely different because at that okay. point you have nodes. Ah, okay. You have so you completely gap this. Okay, no, no, thank you. So there's John was first and then. Since showing this mentioned to great thing is where you make it and you just refer to it, maybe I can just add to, add to that. I mean, okay. so this stuff has been, or similar stuff has been extensively studied in that system. Where the language, the simple language that's used, often these ultrasonic spectroscopy of the pairs. So if you think of a pair heuristically as a, a diatomic model, um, then um, what you're doing is you're looking at the excited states of all the pairs. And oh. So you fingerprint what the pairing state is. Um, and in the B phase, you have access to that mode. Mm -hmm. The A phase is a bit. So, um, Am I right in thinking that there is an analogy between what you're describing and what I mean, it, it, the case of an increase is much more complicated. First of all, it's a 3D order parameter. These are 2D order parameters. So we are in 2D. Uh, that's 3D. We don't have triplets. I did a work, like I did the same on B plus IP, but always moving inside the. Uh, the plane with the s equal zero. So in that scenario, you have more modes because you can have the excitation also out of plane. So it's not all. It's not just in plane oscillation of stuff of, of the other parameters. It's also in this uh, direction. So I mean that's that's much more complicated than whatever I have done here. Do not matter. So the momentum in the bump uh, for the uh, for this plot, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. For the calculation of this, uh, it's essential. So they appear here. If I change to that picture, change. This picture, I wouldn't be able to calculate if it was zero. Yeah. This, of course, yes. This, no. Right, but if it's non-zero, that's all that matters once it's non-zero. I mean, this is the, the transit of or conductivity with this year that we are sending a laser and it's transferring some sort of momentum and then we can induce some current and then we can calculate. Yeah. So we need some sort of momentum. Okay, I think we better stop here and move on. So thanks, Phil, again. <laughs>